Hello everyone, uh, thank you for a warm welcome. I'm Elena, I'm from ITV, and welcome to my talk on how to validate your client churn model. Very briefly about me, I joined ITV last year, um, and it's ITV that I actually started building uh, client churn prediction models for um, ITV Hub Plus platform, which is an ad-free video on demand platform. ITV has a data science team of four data scientists and one intern, and we're actually looking for one more data scientist to join us. So here is a brief talk outline. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through how survival analysis is used for client churn. Um, I'll give an overview of Kaplan Meyer estimator and the Cox proportion hazards model and how to feed one to your data using Lifelines package. Um, and then we'll look at the assumptions that the CPH model makes and how to estimate the residuals and actually estimate your model accuracy. Okay, so, so, so survival and analysis with client churn. So all subscribers eventually churn, but it would be nice to know when they're going to do that, because if we know that, we could potentially postpone um, the time they're going to churn, which would be great for the business. So how to predict the length, the length of subscription time? Um, we could use something like linear regression, but it doesn't guarantee that the time will be always positive. We could use something like key nearest neighbor or decision trees, um, but it doesn't give us any probabilistic term structure for, for, um, for subscription length. Survival analysis used in medical statistics guarantees that T is always positive, and it also provides the term structure for 10 years. This talk is going to cover only the Cox proportional regression model with non-time varying coefficients. So how do we measure time and when does the clock start? So the clock starts when the, um, when the viewer, in this case the ITV Hub Plus subscriber, subscribes, and it stops when they churn. Um, we have viewers, view, uh, of course, subscribers who are still with us. We also have subscribers who churn and resubscribe. Um, the green uh, points, they correspond to the essentially 10-year ad censorship. So if the subscribers are still with us, it is, these are censored uh, points. And the distribution of T at censorship is assumed to be independent from uh, T at churn. However, it's not always the case because ITV schedule is actually seasonal. Um, and these two may not necessarily be independent. So when I started building the um, churn prediction models, I had a lot of questions. So for, for example, what data to calibrate the model on? At ITV, we have data, viewing data, that corresponds to viewers while they're subscribed, as well as when they're not subscribed. Can we use the not subscribed data or not? Um, what to do with those who churn and resubscribe? How can we um, essentially combine their uh, subscription um, 10 years data? And what features can we actually use in the model? So at ITV, we, um, we essentially calibrate the model only to the data that's pertaining to the subscription. Um, we have a separate model for those who churn and return. We call it churners and returners. And another model for those who just uh, experience never churned or actually already churned. Um, and the features that we use in the model are only those that describe the subscribers but do not leak any information by the tenure. So for example, we wouldn't include something like total monthly paid or what, what's the total they have paid so far for their subscription. So uh, this is going to be the slide with most mathematics, so bear with me. So T is a random variable and it has a positive PDF, F of T. 1 minus the cumulative F of T gives us the survival probability function. A hazard function is an instantaneous failure rate at time t given a life up to t. It can be expressed as a derivative of the log of the survival function. And the cumulative hazard function is essentially a cumulative of the hazard and it can be simply expressed as a negative log of the survival function. Those are essential definitions in almost all of the survival analysis literature. So here is a, a graph for, on the left of the survival function fitted using Kaplan Meier estimator, and to the right we have the cumulative hazard density function. You see they're essentially symmetric. And if we look at the rate of change of the log of the survival, that gives us the hazard rate. So what do we actually model and how do we estimate the, the PDF? Well, actually, different models in survival analysis, they tackle different things. For example, Kaplan-Meier is a purely non-parametric product lim limit estimator for the survival function. It's defined as the uh, product of the ratio of number of observations, so number of events, versus those that are at risk. 
as it's a conditional estimator because every next um, probability of survival is uh, scaled by the previous probability, probability at the previous time. So here is an example. Um, I'll also demonstrate the notebook of how to do that using Laughlin's package. Um, this is the data from a telco data set, the telco churn data set from Kaggle. So at time zero, um, we have that no observations. So the observation column is zero, um, and the survival probability is one for everyone. At time one, we have 257 observations. And the probability of survival for everybody is essentially one minus the 257 divided by the ratio of what is at risk. And at risk is always adjusted for this censored observation. So censored observation is where they disappear from, from your data, but you actually don't know their outcome. Or they're still in the data and they just reach that tenure. So SFT is a product limit data-driven ratio, essentially. But if you had some additional information about your subjects, such as their age and gender, it doesn't take that into account. So Cox proportion hazards model is a semi-parametric regression model now for the hazard rate. So we are not modeling survival probability, we're modeling the hazard rate. Let's say we have some information vector of covariates for X, also known as explanatory variables. Um, we know their time to event, we know what is the outcome, and then the hazard rate, according to the Cox proportion hazards model, is defined as the product of the baseline function for, for time t, uh, scaled by the exponential form of the linear regression. So you can see that only the baseline function actually has the time um, as its um, functional input, and the exponential form actually doesn't vary with time. The exponential form guarantees that you always have a positive hazard rate. So CPH has essentially two components, the time varying baseline hazard, which is the same for all subjects, but it varies with time, and time invariant partial hazards that depend on subjects' values for covariates, but there is no time variability there. So if they evolve with time, then this model is not appropriate. The hazard functions for any two subjects, they relate by a constant ratio of their partial hazards. So that means that the, uh, that's essentially the reason for the proportion and the words for CPH. Um, you can feed your CPH to your data using these um, Python packages. Uh, Lifelines is, a, is a, um, a very well used, very well known package, originally developed by Cameron, Davis, and Pilon. There is a Saki survival package, also quite, quite useful. I've come across Tick Survival, which is uh, mostly used for modeling hoax processes. And I recently discovered Pi Survival, which implements something quite interesting called Survival Forest. Um, at the moment, it appears that Pi survival is not actively maintained. Laughlands package has a really nice support channel. It also has very nice website with tutorials. So this is taken directly from their website, the snapshot. This is the derivation of the hazard rate. Note that the uh, covariates, they are standardized in the fit, and regression coefficients, they are found using maximum partial, partial likelihood estimator and newton rapsat iterative search method. The ties in T in lifelines at the moment are resolved using Afrin method. So the partial hazard function is estimated first from the data. Um, and then the baseline hazard function is estimated from a cumulative partial hazard estimates group by tenure. So now I'm going to show you a demo how to fit the Kaplan-Meier estimator for survival probability and um, CPH to your data. Uh, so I'm showing you which uh, uh, versions of Lifelines and Scikit-Learn I'm using here. By the way, this notebook is on my GitHub page uh, for you to inspect. So we're going to load all the libraries that we will use. And um, in this case, I'm just loading the, um, the data directly from my, uh, from my folder, but you can download it from Kaggle. I'm giving you the, the link to the data set. And the first thing we're going to do is to uh, split the data into train and test. Um, before we do any uh, transformations. Note that in this case, I'm doing a stratify. Um, and this is something that caught me out before where I stratified only on the target class, so churn, without providing the tenure, it can give you funny results. So if you decide to stratify, you need to stratify on both. Um, I'm going to use the circuit survival one hold encoding uh, a module to perform one hold encoding because I want to reuse the object later on the uh, test data set. 
So after performing all of this transformation, this is briefly to show you what's the distribution of the uh, churn class in the data. So we have a lot of um, churners at the start with very small tenures, and then a lot of subscribers who are still in telco, um, and they are at much longer tenures. And it's essentially like a U-shaped distribution of, cl of the class. To fit Kaplan Meyer to it is actually very easy uh, using lifelines. Um, you instantiate the Kaplan Meyer theta object, and then you just provide it tenure and churn. So tenure is the uh, is the duration, and churn is one or zero. And it is. It also allows you to see what's the event table that it builds internally, uh, and it fits the data very quickly. It allows you to see and plot the survival uh, function. So this is something we've seen already on the slides as well as the cumulative hazard function. So because the data set actually um, essentially terminates at about 72 months, and the raw at that data point, the raw um, telco clients who haven't churned, it will predict a constant probability of 59% after 72 months. Uh, and then we'll move on to feed Cox proportion hazard regression. So before I can do that, I actually have to remove quite a lot of redundant fields from the data that were uh, produced by one hot encoder. And you can see here is that it's the yellow dead point, um, dots on the um, correlation plot, uh, correlation matrix plot. There's quite a lot of highly correlated data in, the, in uh, points in the data. So we're going to remove them, and we will also remove the total charges, because total charges in this data set correlates highly with, uh, with tenure. And after we do that, we can then carry on and call the Cox pH feeder. In this case, I'm using a small penalizer. It's an L2 penalizer, but it will succeed even without it. The output of uh, CPH, you can see it using print summary, and it gives a really nice summary out with every covariate, with corresponding coefficient, the exponential of the coefficient, the p-value for the coefficient, and the lower and the upper bounds. It also gives you something like a concordance score and log likelihood ratio. I will talk about those a bit later. But because I pretty much used all of the features except the ones that were redundant, there is quite a lot of features here. And you can see a lot of these features are actually not statistically significant. So their p-value is very large. So let's go back to the slides. Oops. Sorry. Okay. So we have filled the model, and now the question is, is it any good? So let's take a look at the assumptions that the CPH model makes. It's a regression model, and it is making at least the following assumptions. So if you don't uh, perform any transformations on your covariates, there will be a linearity in the covariates, as well as the multiplicative covariate effect on the hazard rate. Um, CPH, the underlying assumption, is the prop proportionality of the hazard function for any two subjects, and there are ways to test if, whether that holds or not. Um, of course, we assume that there are no outliers in the data, so no significantly influential data points. And finally, we also assume that the model can pr correctly predict churn for different customer risk groups, so the, data, uh, the model is correctly calibrated. So for each assumption, we're going to look at this um, method, essentially, to check whether that assumption holds. Uh, for the first, we'll look at Martingale residuals, how to calculate them and interpret them, uh, something called concordan in concordan in concordance index and the UNA concordance. Uh, we'll look at Schoenfeld residuals for the proportionality assumption, deviance um, and score residuals, and the IUC and the Bryce score for uh, survival analysis. So what is the concordance score? So essentially, concord, uh, concordant means things that are in alignment. If we take any two subjects and compare their hazard rate, if the first subject's hazard rate is l greater than the second subject and its tenure is less than the second subject, these pairs are concordant. Similarly, if the first subject hazard rate is less than the second subject, oops, and 
sorry, <laughs> and um, his or, or her tenure is greater, then these pairs are also concordant. Any other combination essentially imply that the, the, these two pairs are not concordant. Lapland's package provides uh, a concordance index calculation, so in the absence of ties, um, every uh, record will be compared to every other record, so there will be essentially a binomial number co uh, coefficient of comparisons. Tied observations, they are excluded from comparison. However, the census observations, they are included in the comparison. And be because of that, census observations, they may result in the upward bias in the C-score. Um, Hajime Ona and others from the Harvard University, they proposed an estimator which is meant to be free of sensory distribution. So its definition is essentially it's the concordance index, but it's weighted by the censoring probability derived using the Kaplan-Meier estimator. Just like you have a distribution, um, essentially a churn distribution with churn tenures, you can create uh, a censoring probability with data points that are censored. And IPCW stands for inverse probability of censoring weights. Um, Una concordance index is actually implemented in psychic survival and we'll look at how to use it. So let's move on to the residuals. This is a regression model. And Martingale residuals in one uh, we should look at and it's essentially defined as the difference between observed and expected at time t. Uh, the residuals are uh, they have an upper bound of one for uncensored observations and an upper bound of zero for censored observations, but they have no lower lower bound. So essentially they are quite not, not very symmetrical. Uh, positive Martinger residuals, they essentially imply that the hazard is underestimated. And negative reg um, residuals imply that the hazard is overestimated or you are dealing with a censored observation. So here's a plot of Martingale residuals on ITV's own, for ITV's own churn model. Um, this, is a, this is essentially a plot of the residuals versus duration. So we can see there, is, uh, there are two um, clustering around the 12 and 24 months. This corresponds to um, uh, clients who haven't churned and they've been with us for this long. This was estimated at end of May. Uh, but overall, you see some outliers, so data points that are uh, essentially um, have very large Martingale residual calculated for them, but it's di very difficult to judge what is actually going on. And in order to spot nonlinearity, we have to overlay what's called the lowest lines or locally scattered plots moving lines. Um, a left lens package allows you to calculate that, and so you can calculate and overlay it to your Martingale residuals plot. Here is uh, a Martingale residual plot. So you, 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 don't, you, you don't have to plot them against your duration. You can also plot them against the covariates that you use or even don't use in your model. Here is an example of a Martingale residual plot against something called sticky score. Um, this is a feature that we calculate at ITV, which is essentially a product of viewers' genre diversity and their monthly loyalty. So it's their uh, stickiness, how often they come back to the uh, hub or hub plus and it's always normalized by the period that you calculated for. So we, we're not actually leaking um, the, the length of the tenure that you're calculating for. So again, to spot nonlinearity, we need to add the lowest lines, which is the scatter plot smoothing lines. So here we can see that there is nonlinearity in, um, in the data, essentially that we're using this covariate as part of the model, and we make largest errors for the smallest sticky score. Because Martingale residuals are not symmetric, it's still fairly difficult to judge what is going on. So Devin's residuals, they are a transformation on Martingale residuals to achieve that symmetry. They have the same sign interpretation as Martingale residuals, and they can be used to examine the functional model fit as well as to identify the, the outliers in the data. So here's the plot of the same uh, feature sticky score now using the events residuals. It's much easier to see what's actually going on. So we see we're making largest, um, obtaining largest residuals for uh, churn customers that actually exhibit high sticky score. And it makes sense because we expect high sticky score to actually belong to loyal, loyal subscribers. And the error in this case, Davin's residuals is smaller for, um, for customers who've been with us sorry, who, who are still with us. 
shown for residual is used to test proportionality, hazards, proportionality of the hazards assumption. It's defined for each covariate and it's the difference between the observed and the average covariate in the risk set at each duration. It's not defined for censored observations. Here is a graph of shown for residuals um, that is available to calculate and plot using Lifelands package. Um, Lifelands actually uh, scales the Schoenfeld residuals by variance covariance matrix of the coefficients. So Lifelands actually provides you by default these lowest lines and any departure from a constant line means essentially you've got the assumption doesn't hold. So how to fix it? Small concordance score implies low accuracy, and to fix it, you would in introduce new features, and the features would depend on whether you are over or underestimating the hazards. If you have large multi-gate residuals with non-constant lowest lines, then consider introducing interactive terms or even uh, changing the form of the covariates for example, squaring or cubing them. The pro proportionality assumption, if it doesn't hold, then stratify the covariate by the covariate that breaks the assumption. So Lifelands library will allow you to perform what's called a non-interactive stratification, meaning that the baseline hazard function will vary by that covariate. There is also another method which is called interaction model stratification, meaning that the regression coefficients will vary by the covariate, by the covariate strata. So now we're going to look at the, again, demonstration for how to calculate the scores. So now you know what is concordance index. Um, the summary from Laughlin's package will output concordance index for you, and obviously the higher the closer to one, the better. Also, log likelihood ratio test, the higher these values, the better, the more essentially impactful your covariates are. But because there are so many um, covariates that are not statistic statistically significant, I'm going to remove them. I'm going to just leave seven and refit the model using seven covariates only. So the output of the refit is actually we obtain a very close concordance score to the previous one, so 86, and still a, a good likelihood ratio test. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention the interpretation of the coefficients. So negative coefficients, they have a reductive effect on your hazard, and positive coefficients have an increasing effect on your hazard. So for example, in this case, anybody who have multiple lines is less likely to churn. So their hazard rate is actually lower than those who don't have multiple lines. Okay, um, and also I'm just showing, demonstrating here how to plot the uh, different survival um, graphs. So we're going to call, calculate the concordance index. Um, it is, so it, it's, it's output of the print of the summary uh, feed from Lifelands package, and it's also available through the psychic survival. But you need to transform the data before you can um, use it um, with circuit survival. To calculate UNA, UNA's concordance index, it is um, a call to a concordance index IPCW function from circuit survival package. And so here in this case, um, it's actually very close to the uh, just the C index. It's 88 versus 86. Okay, I'm just going to scroll through uh, these, this section, we'll come back to that and we'll talk about the martingale residuals, how to do that. Um, it's actually very easy to calculate martingale residuals uh, using Lifelands package. It's just the compute residuals on your fitted function, and you just specify the type of residuals you want. So in this case, it's martingale. And it, I'm using, it doesn't allow you to uh, plot the results that easily, so you have to write your own plotting, um, essentially, function. But um, Lifelands package does calculate, does have a way to calculate the lowest lines. So here we can see that for telco data set, we have quite a bit of nonlinearity at the start and towards the end. And I also demonstrate very quickly how to calculate the deviance residuals. Um, plotting multiple residuals against a binary covariate doesn't provide that much insight. Um, but for example, here, contract months to months, we see that um, largest residual is where 
the uh, contract month to month is yes, and smallest where it's not, but this could also be just purely a distribution that comes from your data. So deviance residuals. Um, it's exactly the same function call where you just specify deviance for the type of residual. And to plot, it's much easier to see what's going on. The highest at the start for churned, and then the error increases towards the lo um, greater 10 years for the ones who are still subscribed. Okay. In this notebook, I'm also providing you an example of how to cal calculate the score residuals and Schoenfeld residual. There are two ways to calculate it in uh, using Lapland's package. One is just by purely calling the calculate re compute residuals method. And another one is by calling something called check assumptions, which is a really useful function. And it provides these plots for every covariate in your model. So essentially, you need to look at the lowest lines and any departure from a constant line means that the assumption doesn't hold. And to stratify, it's very easy it's to just refit the model with the features that break the proportionality assumption in the strata. You'll see that after you stratify, that the concordance score will go down because you're essentially taking away the richness of your uh, set of covariates from the exponential form. Sorry about that. Again, we go back to the start. Okay, so we'll, let's also talk about the IUC for survival analysis, how it's defined, and um, a few other methods. So essentially, IUC is a measure of model sensitivity versus specificity. In case of survival analysis, it's actually defined as a covariate to the outcome concordance score. So it's defined in, 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 in terms of covariates. Sensitivity is a probability that M, the size of your covariate, is greater than some threshold given that the event has occurred. And specificity is the probability that M, the size of your covariate, is below the threshold given that the event hasn't yet occurred. Second survival implements IUC calculation and it actually can be used to test each individual covariate you're thinking of introducing into the model as well as the overall fitted model. So here is a graph of the I, our IUC from the Telco data set. We see that an average IUC of around 92%. Looks just really, really good. But here's a word of warning on IUC, usage of IUC for survival analysis from Drew Griffin Devi. Um, and this is taken from a blog from Frank Harrell's uh, website called Statistical Thinking. Uh, essentially, uh, the warning is that IUC may not necessarily be very good in judging how well your model can perform in, in, in the future. So for the other method, I'll just talk about the Briar score, which is essentially a score to assess probabilistic models. It's defined as the squared average difference between the probability that you predict at time t and whether the event took place. So yes or no, one or zero. The smaller the score, the better the model is calibrated. However, the output should really be compared with the score obtained using a null model, so something like a Kaplan-Meier. You will find in the literature that the score of 0.25 is, sub is considered to be a fence feeder fence seater, but really the output should be compared to the null model. So for scores in the IUC tests, um, all of them can be performed on something what's called the out of sample, as well as out of time sample data set. So out of sample where you split your data into uh, train and test, and out of sample where you actually create, um, come up with a, a threshold in time and say I'm going to use this data before the time for training and afterwards for testing. And I would encourage you to use both for survival analysis. So in conclusion, lifelines and psychic survival, they are both excellent tools to um, essentially perform survival analysis and build client-churn models. They come with very good validation utilities. 
survival model validation is actually extensively covered in medical statistics and biostatistics papers and research, and it's gradually becoming more accessible through Python libraries for data scientists. It's important to use more than one validation technique to actually gauge um, the uh, accuracy of your model. Here are the references for those who are interested, and thank you very much. Yeah, so it's, it actually provides you with the probabilistic uh, tenor structure for each tenure. What's the probability of churning in the next months? What's the probability of churning in two months and so forth? That will be the main advantage.